for me, one way that I manage, because I could be very, very deeply distraught by all sorts of problems in the world. I mean, I, I'm a sensitive person like so many of us. And I look at nature and look at the array of beauty and hardship and cruelty and suffering and an unimaginable beauty. Like if, you know, I mean, under the ocean or in rainforests that I haven't been to or whatever, but just how extraordinary nature is. And for me to that, I take solace in that as opposed to just seeing for example all the suffering so that's some of the complexity expanding complexity i've since learned that neurobiologists who look at emotion say and i'm i'm hesitating because i haven't read the original source material i read a chapter in an edited book that was about this that the complexity of emotional experience is the place of maximum flexibility and adaptability and that we can think of it as being in the flow of a river and we don't want to get caught on either of the river banks the river bank of rigidity or the river bank of chaos so we want to be in the complexity apparently at a neurobiological level that's best for us in terms of emotion but for people who are working with death and dying or trauma i mean i'm a, I'm, I'm assuming i don't want to speak for the field of people who work in uh, in palliative care but we need to see things in their complexity because if we get a single focus or, or too narrow a focus we miss out on so much beauty like someone's at the end of their life, but there's what came before, which I'm sure is not always, I know, is not all, even is not always enriched. I mean, sometimes that's more suffering and compounds, but we, or we need to look out and see beyond this moment. So that's what I, that's what I found from the people I was speaking with. And that's how I named it, Expanding Complexity. Welcome to Inspiring Heartfelt Conversations. My name is Barbara Morningstar. This series is presented by In Autumn's Cocoon, which offers workshops and talks on a range of end-of-life subjects for healthcare professionals and the public to provide greater awareness and enhanced end-of-life tools. For more information, you can go to inautumnscocoon.com. Today, my guest is Dr. Richard Harrison. He's a faculty member of AEDP Institute and a registered psychologist with over 25 years experience as a clinician and teacher. He was trained and supervised in AEDP by Diana Fosha, founder of The Model. He is a certified supervisor in both AEDP and EFT. Richard teaches and supervises graduate students in the counseling, psychology, and psychiatric departments at the University of British Columbia and maintains a full clinical caseload with individuals and couples in private practice in Vancouver. Welcome, Richard. I'm so grateful to have you here today for this much needed conversation. I'm happy to be here, Barbara. That's great. So today, just so the audience understands where we're going to go with, with this conversation and theme and focus, uh, we're going to discuss the research you did for your 2008 PhD dissertation and some subsequent papers on that subject on protective practices of seasoned mental health therapists highlighting ways they maintain both their personal and professional well-being and were basically thriving i put that word in but they, it sounded like they were thriving in their work instead of burning out mm -hmm. which is something that we would love to see with everyone right Absolutely. and 
Yeah. And so, and also to you coined this beautiful term, exquisite empathy, which we're going to touch on more fully as the conversation unfolds. So we we'll dive into it now. And my first, <laughs> my first clarifying question is in your bio, there's a reference to AEDP and EFT, and a lot of people aren't going to know what that is. So can you brief, give a brief explanation of what those terms mean? Yeah, they're psychotherapy models. So EFT is emotionally focused therapy. And I think of it as emotionally focused couple therapy, because that's how it originated. And AEDP is now known by the acronym. And it's a healing oriented psychotherapy treatment that we've been doing research on. And it's it's proven effective at this point, uh, which is very exciting, where we really draw on the therapy relationship to offer people corrective emotional experiences to help them get in touch, to help them feel secure in their connection with self and connection with another with others. Mm -hmm. And it's a it's a model for healing emotional suffering and trauma, and then promoting flourishing. So in keeping with your thriving mm -hmm. uh, affirmation there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful. So in your dissertation, mm -hmm. you focused on the resiliency and as we say, the thriving of professionals. What a concept. Like we're hearing about burnout all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what drew you to do that research? Well, part of it was doing a PhD, there's this, I'm going to delve into a topic. And I thought it would suit me to look at what keeps my colleagues and especially professional elders or mentors well in this work. That's what I wanted. If I was going to focus in this very intensive way, I thought that would be generative for me, but also for others. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay. Makes sense to me. <laughs> if you're yeah. going to go into a profession, you want to enjoy it and thrive in it, right? And Yeah. And I came, not to interrupt you, but I came, uh, I went back to school a couple times as a mature student. So I did my, my PhD at a fairly, fairly ripe age, I had a mature age. I'd already been working as a clinician, mental health therapist. Um, but I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to find out what sustains people because there are risks and the risks are identified. And I was very interested in that as well, in trauma and in what gets called secondary trauma. The risk when we're in close relationship, professional relationship with people who are suffering, there are risks to the self of the therapist, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was interested. Right. Sorry. Beautiful. So let's just touch on a couple of words that might come up throughout too, like vicarious trauma and um, compassion fatigue. Again, <laughs> just a, a brief kind of explanation of what that might be for the audience, for people who may not fully understand those words. Yeah. These concepts also get sometimes get called secondary traumatic stress. It's the notion that those of us who work with people who've experienced traumatic stressors, things that adversely affect their well-being, that are, that are serious traumatic events where people typically felt isolated and affects worldview and sense of self and sense of the future, folks who experience those primary trauma, that's that's primary traumatic stress. But those of us who get close to people who are experiencing traumatic stress, who are, who are experiencing, doesn't have to be PTSD, but people who have been traumatized, that's what I'm trying to say. When it can end up, there's a secondary stress, trauma of our worldviews can start to get shaped too, because we're interacting with so much of pain and suffering and hardship that it can actually lead to a form of compassion fatigue, where somebody's sense of 
hair starts to get, I want to somehow say, uh, when we get under-resourced, then we get depleted. There's the word I'm looking for. Where this, I think of, you know, a fountain in the tarot deck or something where you've got things flow out, but they also need to flow in. Mm -hmm. And so we need replenishment in order to keep being present with this kind of pain and suffering. And so people can end up in a version of burnout or what gets was called compassion fatigue or vicarious traumatization because we're not traumatized by the events in the world directly, but vicariously because we are in close contact with people who have been. Is that clear enough? It is clear. And and of course, this series is specifically focused on end of life care when you're around people who are dying or grieving or their family members. And sometimes you're hearing the stories of other people, but other times you are witness to their suffering as well. And as a human being, can't not. I love the, the quote by Rachel Naomi Remen, who says people who think they, that they can be around suffering and not be impacted is like saying you can walk through water and not get wet. Mm. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, how do you traverse serving people in that capacity, but also nurturing your own heart and humanity at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in your dissertation, what I love, I've read it twice. Uh -huh, <laughs> I, I wow. loved it. I loved it, Richard. I mean, I'm in my <laughs> mid-60s now. I started in hospice back in my early 30s, and I had beautiful and had continued to have beautiful mentors throughout. But I, what I loved about this dissertation, and it was a handful of, of individuals. I think you had about six participants yes, in the yes. original mm -hmm. paper. But mm -hmm. But truth doesn't have to be big. It can be in the simplest things. And you used a narrative style when you spoke with these therapists. Can you tell me why you chose the narrative style? Sure. And I want to just, uh, before doing so, if it's okay, you mentioned thriving, and that was one of the, what do we call them? I'm sort of removed at this point from the uh, academic world in that way and the research, that kind of research. But um, criteria, <laughs> that was some of the selection criteria. People who self-identified and were peer nominated as doing well, thriving in this work despite the risks. So that feels important to me that that, that we kind of put that forward. Now, back to your question, the narrative my using a narrative method was congruent with how I am. <laughs> uh, I it, First of all, there's a transparency in people are telling me their histories, their stories, their experiences. And I wanted transparency in letting them and others know where I based my conclusions, and I wanted it to be collaborative all the way through. Mm -hmm. And I've always loved letter writing. Mm -hmm. And I viewed the research interviews as conversations. Mm -hmm. They were research conversations in the, in the service of knowledge, in the, of discovery and knowledge, sharing knowledge. So, but they were conversations. So I thought, what better method or means, way, than writing, writing letters. And uh, on my journey, I also studied narrative therapies extensively, and I had the good fortune of working with Michael White in the intensive for six days or a week in, in Australia, and that was a really remarkable experience, actually. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful to Michael White for what he offered us while he was alive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the beauty for me, too, and it made it more palatable in a way, too, because I felt the heart and humanity of both you as the as the researcher, the curious one to know the hearts and, and humanity of the people doing the work. But I also felt the depth of not just in an intellectual way, in a deeper way, how they were living it through the exchange and the writing and the narrative style. So I just want to honor you for choosing that way of doing it, because I was able to receive the research more, I think, for me, I can only speak for me, deep, more deeply. 
And it actually was very affirming for things I learned along the way in my work in hospice care too. So very inspiring. So thank you for that choice too. So you're welcome. And I just want to take a moment to really receive because you're honoring that in the work that there were ideas, but there's also heart and something deeper is very meaningful to me. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Okay, so now we're actually going to move into, you You found 12 key uh, protective practices. And I know even in the writing, you were going, it's so intricate. <laughs> How do I narrow it down to these, you know, these 12 things or these, these categories, which you had a hesitancy in doing, but in, in a way too, you don't want to lose the key points, right? So no doubt there was an right. art to even doing that. Yeah, um, things are holographic sometimes, where the whole is in each part, but it's important to parse them out or to break, to be able to, as you say, identify. And yeah, there you go. Yeah. So we're going to free flow with it instead of it kind of making a point, 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 you know, free flow with it together. And I'm just going to give you each principle and then just let you share with me what comes up for you or the reflections that you learned in the research. So the first one, which I think is incredibly important, all of them are, (laughs) but countering isolation in professional, personal, and spiritual realms. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I want to say about that is that connection heals. Mm -hmm. We know that from attachment theory. I read Bal Mount's beautiful paper, Mutual Healing Connections, I think it was called. Healing when Connections. I, doing... I love that paper. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. yeah. No, that's okay. I, I'm totally okay to be, I, I, yeah. the, as you say, the flow, and I hope it's going okay for you yeah, as well. Beautiful. I mean, that I'm as verbal as I am or whatever. Yeah. So connection heals. And too many therapists, and I was really working with mental health therapists who work with trauma specifically. Too many trauma therapists are working way too much in isolation. And I imagine that's also, it's not every palliative care provider who has the good fortune to have a team wrapping them around or to be enfolded into a team. Is that so? Is that true of palliative care as well? Generally, palliative care is is team-oriented, perhaps even more so than some of the other teams in healthcare and other departments. Um, But you, in rural communities and sort of, smaller areas you might not have the full team of of players that you would in a larger city as access so honoring what you're saying there right yeah yeah and i'm so glad to hear that and i I mean i know about palliative care but it's not my main area of focus um i used to work with women and kids who had been traumatized by typically by woman 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 abuse or by what yeah i'm not going to whitewash it or i'm not going to kind of use a euphemism like domestic violence but in an intimate partner violence usually woman abuse and too many of the workers in the programs at least in british columbia and canada where i was are people really working on their own way too much and you cannot do that type of work in isolation so connection heals and you mentioned diana fosha in the introduction and she's a friend and a mentor and a force of she's a marvel of the universe i'm very grateful for all that she sees and her sensitivity and anyway diana fosha calls aloneness unbearable aloneness with overwhelming emotional experiences that are too much to handle on one's own she calls that the epicenter of suffering, psychological suffering. And so I didn't know about that. Her, you know, I didn't know about the ADP and that way of working when I was doing that research. But yeah, we want to undo aloneness of people. We want to counter isolation because not everyone's getting supervision and they need it if they're working with in trauma. Not everyone has access to colleagues. And we need a personal life. And we need, as I said, um, resourcing energy in and joy as and and uh nourishment in our personal lives and on a spiritual level as well whatever however anybody defines spirituality but there are different 
there's the up close and personal, there's the more professional realm, and then there's larger societal and larger trans, uh, transcendent, whatever, trans, uh, the spiritual things that transcend our ability to articulate, where we find meaning, where we find our, our deepest understandings. We need to undo, we need to counter isolation in those realms. So that was, my, those are my thoughts about that, uh, mm -hmm. that theme. Do you have any well, further well, comments? Well, it's just this? honoring again, bridging back to Dr. Bell for Mount's paper with uh, Robin Cohen and one other author whose name I don't, who slipped my mind right now, but I just did an interview with Daphne, Dr. Daphne Law, the palliative physician on that and healing connections with yourself, with the community, with the phenomenal world, the senses, nature, um, the arts and finding meaning, he also highlights in that uh, paper. And so again, you're just affirming that people and, and the research showed that people do much better, as you're saying, when they expanded out and reached out to have those connections and celebrated mm -hmm. them in their lives, right? Mm -hmm. So not only mm -hmm. for the therapist, for the person, but for the person that you're serving as well. So. Yeah, yeah. And these findings from the research were commonalities that these six master is a gendered term, but they were master therapists, they were professional mentors or elders. And these are commonalities that, that so these ideas came from these conversations that I had the good fortune to engage in. Um, and, and it makes sense to me that Daphne Lobb and other uh, and um, others and uh, have have are speaking about similar ways of being well. Right. Well, connection, the trees, right? I love the trees, and they're connected through the roots, and we need to be too. I mean, we're designed hmm. for connection, right? There you go. Absolutely, it's built into our organism. Yeah, and that's attachment theory. Also, we all do better when some we've got someone when we know there's someone we can turn to when we're struggling. Yeah, absolutely. We're social oh, beings. Okay. We yeah. absolutely are. So let's go into the next one. Mm -hmm. And it's developing mindful self-awareness. And I just, I want to, so I'm going to put that out to you, but I want to just make a point that I think is important. We hear the word mindfulness a lot now. Mm -hmm. And I know mm -hmm. it's been very much associated in, in many ways. I could be wrong but with, with a Buddhist and Zen teachings, um, which I respect. Um, mm -hmm. But so I just want to ask you why that's important, but also maybe define what mindfulness is, because that may not, that word may not resonate with everyone in the same way. Mm -hmm. So a mm -hmm. definition and, and developing mindful self-awareness, what do you mean by that? So the way I defined it in the, uh, dissertation was, if I recall, moment to moment, uh, well, awareness of the shifting, moment to moment shifting, inner and external experience. That's how I define mindfulness. Um, I, I, obviously, it's not, I didn't come up with the concept, but that's, that was my working definition. Why is it important? Um, so I keep talking about emotion and attachment because those are the directions I've gone in in my acad in my curiosity. You know, I was going to say academic curiosity, but that's my professional curiosity has gone more in those directions. And we do know that affect regulation and emotion regulation, when we can reflect on own my own e experience, who was it, Dan Siegel, perhaps, who said, if you can name it, you can tame it. When we can reflect on it, we can manage it better. Um, if you, I don't know if you've ever been caught in, for example, anxiety, but when I can watch myself with kind acceptance, even of something that I'm not wanting, when I can witness myself and accompany myself through that's way better than just being in the throes of it. It's like a double, what do they call it? They, they, they call it um, 
I guess a dual awareness of some in a way because we're in something, but we're simultaneously witnessing or reflecting, and and it makes life go better. But I can't really speak to the why of it beyond that. So is that also about you're saying about just being more aware of what you bring to the moment as well with the other person in in serving someone? Okay, thank you. That really helps me to say just to as well reflect and realize that there's absolutely yes, it helps us show up in better in in the most optimal ways, I believe. But well, it cultivates presence and we want presence. But in this instance, I think it's also about how we're being impacted. Because if we can be aware, if you think about like the boat on the storms, there's a concept probably in Buddhism of equanimity, and we want to be able to maintain a sense of, my hands are doing this, a sense of balance, even when like the waves are big and might, we don't want to get sloshed around, we want to find equilibrium and balance and equanimity. And mindfulness helps with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's tremendous research at this point. Um, medical school programs are having first year students learn about mindfulness and uh, because there are tremendous health benefits. So there is a whole body of research about the why of it. I don't have it at my fingertips right now. But uh, we are less buffeted by what we encounter in the world and we are more resilient when we have are cultivating a capacity to reflect on how we show up as you mentioned but also how what we're interfacing with is affecting us mm -hmm. i saw a beautiful clip once by franco sesesti who's who's known for his work in in hospice and palliative care and he was talking about listening and, and working with nurses and to listen with the head the heart and the body too mm -hmm. and we don't mm -hmm. always think of listening on a lot of different levels right so yeah just reflecting that back sort of a deeper awareness on so many because that can then open you up to a, a, even a greater transcendent awareness too absolutely yeah i would just want to say a big yes <laughs> To what you're saying yeah yeah and in my clinical practice my therapy practice i've had to untrain or i hope it's not distracting when i interrupt myself like that but i've i learned to be a quick left brain understanding listener it was important in some ways to my emotional survival in my family to be able to reflect back quickly and let the other the caregiver know that i understood and could articulate my parents experience but as a the type of therapist i've become that can interfere with emergent experience and experience in connection is the avenue to change i believe and so what you're describing about listening with the head the heart and the body, that kind of embodied presence and empathic resonance, emotional or affective resonance, letting myself really feel with who I'm with is, has changed my way of being present and working. And I mean, I, I see the effects in the people's lives that I work with. But I, I don't want to like uh, toot my own horn, but I really, it's very heartening when we can learn to be present in the ways you just described, those three levels of listening. What, it, what happens to the people we're being with? That's heartening, I find. You no, know, it's beautiful. It's interesting for me in this work, just honoring what you're saying, I chose to start as a hospice volunteer and I did mm -hmm. have intense training before I did it, but there was no other weight on me 
Um, so say a little more of what? There's Sorry. no other weight on me going into it as a volunteer other than to bring my heart and presence. So okay. in the years, in the foundational years of that, there was such a beautiful deepening of that connection purely and then as i moved into the professional roles i found the opposite all this other stuff started coming on top of me and i, I see oh, how do i maintain that purity that i experienced and yes. still honor the structure and the protocols and the demands so it was kind of for me in the opposite way and that's always been my goal is even if we're talking about information or research and all these important things that we learn that we don't lose the heart of it because at the essence mm -hmm. that's our shared humanity and our connection mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and fortunately some professional training some medical training at least in canada is starting to catch up with the importance of that because Absolutely. the weight you're talking about can really alienate people from what draws them to their work in the first place. Right. And that's a problem, I believe. Yeah. Well, and the beauty, I think, of palliative care, the initial goal with Belmont, like they had the arts, have the arts and all the different disciplines to bring that balance of perspective in, right? So mm -hmm. head and heart. So anyway, lovely. I love this. <laughs> no, I'm happy to know that. <laughs> I'm having fun. I'm enjoying <laughs> being with you and there's yeah okay so the next one was consciously expanding perspective to embrace complexity because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not all of life is pretty right i mean it's can it's both uh, yeah i'll tell you how i think about that and then i'll tell you how my thinking about it has kind of changed over time with a little bit of new knowledge i guess uh, i personally when I, when I'm, for me, one way that I manage, because I could be very, very deeply distraught by all sorts of problems in the world. I mean, I, I'm a sensitive person like so many of us. And I look at nature and look at the array of beauty and hardship and cruelty and suffering and an unimaginable beauty. Like if, you know, the, I mean, under the ocean or in rainforests that I haven't been to or whatever, but just how extraordinary nature is. And for me to that, I take solace in that as opposed to just seeing for example, all the suffering. So that's some of the complexity, expanding complexity. I've since learned that neurobiologists who look at emotion say, and I'm, I'm hesitating because I haven't read the original source material. I read a chapter in an edited book that was about this, that the complexity of emotional experience is the place of maximum flexibility and adaptability. And that we can think of it as being in the flow of a river. And we don't want to get caught on either of the riverbanks, the riverbank of rigidity or the riverbank of chaos. So we want to be in the complexity, apparently at a neurobiological level. That's best for us in terms of emotion. But for people who are working with death and dying or trauma. I mean, I'm, a, I'm, I'm assuming, I don't want to speak for the field of people who work in, uh, in palliative care, but we need to see things in their complexity because if we get a single focus or, or too narrow a focus, we miss out on so much beauty. Like someone's at the end of their life, but there's what came before, which I'm sure is not always, I know, is not all, even is not always enriched. I mean, sometimes that's more suffering and compounds, but we, or we need to look out and see beyond this moment. So that's what I, that's what I found from the people I was speaking with. And that's how I named it, expanding complexity. Beautiful. 
And <laughs> and a lot of them to let go of kind of a utopian view of the world. I got that sense. Um, do you want to speak to that too? Well, yeah, if we're, yes, yeah, sorry, please say more. What, well, yeah, just because, yeah. you know, they these were, a lot of them were um, therapists who were de dealing with very traumatized um, um, clients. And, you know, even listening to some of the things they were facing, though I've been around end of life care and seen a lot in my mm -hmm. life, mm -hmm. there were some things that I was listening to, you know, observing and what I was reading this thinking, Whoa, how would I handle that? You know, how would mm -hmm. I step mm -hmm. into that? And I think I, I had to do that when I first went into hospice palliative care, because there was an overwhelming amount of death and dying happened. And how was I to deal with the volume of death and suffering? And yet you're right. And it was this beauty that was so hard to describe woven together. So there you go. There you go. speaking to the utopian view. and The, the, the utopian view is a setup because we're not in a utopian world. And so we're going, it's unrealistic. I don't mean to be judgmental, but it sets people up to to suffer. The people who hold the, the healers who hold the utopian view, we, if I'm walking around thinking that I can eradicate, if we go back to the work with intimate partner abuse and woman abuse and violence that affects women and children, typically, more often than not, occasionally men as well. But I can't have the goal that I'm going to eradicate hardship. And I think this comes up in another theme later. Uh, I can't, I will be, I will feel like a failure. I will feel discouraged. I will feel ground into the surf and overwhelmed and ineffective. How can I sustain myself if my intention is that somehow I or me and some other like-minded colleagues are going to get rid of violence? It's, it's bigger than us. And it's part of unfortunately, it's part of life. And so I need, I if I have a utopian view to you, you follow me, I'm mm -hmm. setting myself up for feeling like a failure. And being so disheartened, whereas if I, again, the array in nature of cruelty and beauty, I don't want to give a pass, I don't want to condone cruelty. But it personally, it helps me to know that the world involves tremendous complexity. Mm -hmm. It's not either or. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm bridging to that. I hear people saying we want someone to have a good death, a good death. And mm -hmm. Janie Brown and I, in one of my first interviews, we talk about that in more detail. She's a counselor now, used to be a a nurse and a, a site in oncology and we do everything we can it's just like when a baby's born you do everything you can to ensure that the birth goes well but in the end there could be complications or a cesarean occurs it's the same at end of life when my husband we did we're doing the best we could with my husband to have it be an easy transition but he had a tough you know journey of pain management and then emotional wounds from his life coming up to be healed mm -hmm. it was a ride for me mm -hmm. as a as a caregiver and you know i there's this beautiful i'm going to share a little parable there's this beautiful parable about it's in the public domain about a scientist and the emperor moth and the the moss cocoon is big at, at the bottom and narrow at the top and he was watching the emperor moth trying to get out of this narrow opening and he felt compassion for it because it looked so little for him to get so he clipped the top and the moth popped out and was misshapen and kind of walked mm. on the thing and eventually died mm. and so when he did more research about it he later found that other people felt compassion for this little guy trying to get through 
But what it was actually happening is as it went through the narrow opening, it was squeezing fluid into the wings to make them stronger. Uh-huh. And without uh-huh. that step, it couldn't thrive. So uh-huh. I remember going through it with my husband and looking at him sometimes and just wishing he wasn't having to go through that. Mm. But saying to him, you're my emperor moth, honey. <laughs> Mm. you're my emperor moth and in the end what he went through actually broke him open Mm. Mm -hmm. to an amazing place of healing and and love in his own heart that i hadn't seen in the whole time we were together right so Mm -hmm. so i'm grateful that you pointed that out in the dissertation because Mm -hmm. that could have looked like it wasn't going well on some level as people, everyone was working to support him, but it would get to a point and then be adjusted. And, and in the end, there was a birthing of a different kind. Mm -hmm. It wasn't necessarily everybody holding hands around the bedside Mm -hmm. and there was no pain. And well, there was Mm -hmm. in the end, he was comfortable in the end, but it's pulling the view back honoring all of that which even the hard stuff has a has a mm-hmm. has a role mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. so in a way there's two aspects to what i think you've just been speaking about and i just want to honor what you shared as well when you referenced janie brown who i know both janie brown and Daphne, I'm, is Daphne's last name Lob? I'm embarrassed. Yeah, I'm, Daphne Lob. Yeah, they're lovely. Yeah. yeah, I know them not not well, but uh, we have friends in common. And um, Janie ha- also has a reputation as being an extraordinary group uh, group therapist, just ex- like extraordinary. Um, but what I wanted to speak to was: we do our best, or you do your best, and good enough is such an important concept. D- Donald Winnicott, who was a physician, uh, originally a pediatrician, and then became an extraordinary uh, psychoanalyst, actually, and theorist, and uh, really understood and articulated how the self forms in connection. That a uh, precursor to attachment theory in some ways. Um, but Winnicott had the phrase good enough, and especially in the context of parenting, mothering, good enough mother. Because again, we, if we have an idealistic view, utopian view, that's a setup for failure. We good enough is such an important concept. And I think people do their best. And if people, and as you say, hardships happen. Now the, so someone's death may not be as transformational as what you described your husband's death as being through the hardship. So I would imagine sometimes the hardship is hardship and suffering. And good enough is an important concept there, I think, as well. It, you, would you would you follow me? And would well, you and, well, and again, back to, you know, what Janie said about a baby being born, you know, mm-hmm. you have, you have easy labors and hard labors. In the end, the baby's birthed. <laughs> mm-hmm. We can't see the higher view. That's why one of my one of the most popular conversations is with Dr. Bruce Grayson, who's done research out of the University of Virginia on near death experiences. And some may believe that's a possibility, and others not. But the one thing I found fascinating was when the person was above it, they had a whole different perspective on what we would consider to be a challenge or a hardship Mm -hmm, in the midst mm -hmm. of the experience, they were seeing the design of it Mm -hmm. in a Mm -hmm. whole different way. So, Mm -hmm. so just honoring that all of it seems to be important somehow. (laughs) Well, I hope it's, I mean, I hope it's true and I don't know, um, but I hope it's true that even when it looks like the death is not as peaceful or, or or whatever the concepts are that we would want it to be, as easeful, as connected, as surrounded by love and as integrative. I would hope that that is also somehow 
transformational in a good way, even when it looks like it isn't. But I don't, I certainly don't. I wouldn't know. Um, but I appreciate what you said about your husband and how I know from personal experience and early experience, unfortunately, how suffering can open us up. Yes. Yeah, and like you, there's because of my age, I've seen people have had peaceful deaths and sort of challenging unfoldment and just more and more just trying to lean into honor all elements of life. Yeah. Yeah. And being with what is. Exactly. Yeah. Hoping yeah. for the best and most peaceful transition, but honoring whatever unfolds in the most loving way I can, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So that brings mm. us, bridges to the next. We can't see, you know, Janie or um, Daphne and I laughed about it at the end. You said, in the end, we really don't know what's going on. Like we might get hints of some other possibility, but openness to the unknown was another protective mm -hmm. practice mm -hmm. of the, the mm -hmm. therapist. So where do you want to go with that reflection? Mm -hmm. Well, I feel emotion and I feel moved and poignancy. So maybe that's where I'll start just to connect for a moment with what's here. Again, I take solace in that, but that's too personal. I mean, for the concept. Because this wasn't this wasn't coming from my experience, these themes. <laughs> so um, the temptation is just for me to reflect on them as though I didn't wasn't the researcher and link them to my own life experience. But let's so I um I This is very hard for me to answer because I'm too I'm far from the research in some ways. It's 15 years ago. So in some ways, maybe what I need to do is instead speak to my own experience. But as I said before, I take solace in things that are that we can't put a name on. Mm. The ineffable, undefinable. Yeah, yeah. And so I feel like I'm tiptoeing around personal experience, and I may as well just share it with you. Um, because my mother died when I was very young. And why am I telling you that? I think that's part of why I take solace and maybe part of why I know that a utopian expectation is going to let us down. Uh, there's something to me very reassuring about the things that exceed our ability to articulate them, to define them. And when we're facing trauma, or death and dying. I believe that openness to what we can't know helps balance things out, or it expands in a helpful way. So the number pi goes on and on, it's infinite. And it's something that is used mathematically to articulate the circumference of a circle. Now, the circumference of a circle exists. I mean, maybe not in its purest form. A circle might not exist in an idealized form. That would be Plato, I guess. But the phenomena exists. But mathematics, our language system, math is a language system as well, I believe. Our language system can't capture it. I think that's good. I think that's good. So openness to the unknown gets, I, I think, gets us closer to experience and the complexity of experience. And for me, I have comfort in taking it as far as I can and then being open as opposed to starting to put definitions on things that transcend my ability to know. But I, all I can do is speak personally to that theme, unfortunately. I can't remember how it exactly, how it came up in the research and how it was helpful to those clinicians. So my apologies for that. Mm. Well, but it bridges again to end of life care, because there's this unknown, undefinable transition that's taking place. One minute that body's animated with a personality, a breath, and that, you know, I love the title of the book, When Breath Becomes Air. I think that's one of the most 
uh, by a young neuroscientist who died um, in his 30s. He wrote a last memoir of what he was going through. But one minute that body's animated and the next minute when that last breath is taken, something's gone, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's deepening research. I wrote a, a book honoring the mystery, just the observation of how the language starts to change and often becomes more metaphoric because the literal... They're trying to share with us sometimes what's happening and the literal language can't capture this ineffable thing yeah. or they're seeing yeah. things we can't see. And mm -hmm. who's to say mm -hmm. what they're seeing? I can't see it or hear it, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fascinating to lean in, mm -hmm. to learn from the mystery of this very thing we call life, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah loved yeah. that so many of the therapists were open to the mystery yeah it was a commonality yeah yeah okay <laughs> well we're, we're going we are going to a deep place when you said that, you know we're going to go deep into it i thought okay we're just you know i didn't i didn't think of the depth the depth in that way but i'm in yeah, I mean, well, absolutely. life and death and all of it are so beautiful and mysterious at the same time. There's a depth mm -hmm. of it that we can't capture fully in a literal mm -hmm. sense, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful for us exploring this. So the next one was sustaining and renewing hope, which included the trust in the person's the person's capacity to heal. Mm-hmm. Wow, it's so interesting to be revisiting this in the wake of the, where my practice has gone. And uh, because that is like at the heart of AEDP, oddly enough. Um, yeah, Diana Fosha said to me early on, she said, Richard, you were an AEDP therapist before you knew about AEDP. But yes, this, this we, hmm. Otherwise, there's a risk of if we feel overly responsible for a change process, that's a road to burnout. That that comes up. I do a lot of couple therapy, and it's like I don't go home with these people, and I didn't choose to keep put them together or keep them together. <laughs> what I can do is the best that I have to offer. That's also another theme, actually, that's going to come up in a few minutes. But the maintaining hope in people's capacity to heal is. I mean, my hand does this. It's buoyant. It's um. It keeps us. It it's resourceful, resourcing. It keeps us af afloat. I don't know. It keeps us buoyant. It, and there is an innate capacity to self right. It's built in. But I didn't really know as much about that back then. Ah, uh, but this is something I learned from those professional mentors that that was a very important aspect of well-being in this kind of work. And I guess when we think, sorry, yeah, maybe I'll continue the thought. And then, mm -hmm. When we, from what I know about the work of death and dying and the whole notion of care rather than cure and healing, what healing looks like at the end of life, to maintain the hope for that possibility and for the in, people to feel like to have the aloneness undone and to feel connection in that transition in that portal and whatever it is uh i would imagine is sustaining as well that's the word for the buoyancy i was feeling it's sustaining it's restorative what were you gonna say yeah well, it's just, you know, I think over the years, too, and even in my personal life, especially in relationships, <laughs> when I think I'm going to go in there and fix it or think I, I know better than the other person instead of stepping, and we see it in our work, like if you, people getting entangled in the family dance of the patient and thinking they know better how mm. it should be. Mm. 
same in personal life too. I mean, those are the most entangled situations I've found myself in. And why am I prompted to try and fix it? Is it my own discomfort? Hmm. Instead so in a way, of the, uh, yeah. stepping mm-hmm. back and trusting, you know, some of the most, the toughest spots with my husband when I wanted to get, there's a part where he had a nightmare and he had so much fear. And he said, you can't talk me out of this fear. Mm. You can't talk me out of this fear. I'm not going to, I've shared the story before. And I remember standing there thinking, he's right. I can't, but I can love him. Mm-hmm. And accompany him maybe. Be yeah, present and I to cr- him with it. Huh. Crawled into bed and held him like a mother mm-hmm. would a child, and just mm-hmm. which is another beautiful thing. Some of the counselors would go home and their partners would rock them without words mm-hmm. and just hold them. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. As hard as that was sometimes to step back and watch him going through that, which was impacting me, when I just honored it with love and gently supported. Mm-hmm as opposed mm-hmm. to getting entangled. And I still do that in my life sometimes. No, we're human. Yeah, we're all human. <laughs> it it unfolds, especially when you have a deeper attachment bond, I find it harder sometimes because your mm-hmm. heart's woven, but mm-hmm. so well put. give space mm-hmm. to the, with love to the discovery of the other person. It's yeah. much, much actually ends up being less exhausting and kind of miraculous at times. Well, there you go. That's, yeah, so that's totally congruent what you just said with, that's what this research was about, what's less exhausting, and actually sustaining, and perhaps kind of miraculous sometimes. Yeah. So, Hmm. holding space for the other's capacity to heal. Yeah. It just balances things out because, again, that's like the complexity piece as well. It's not just what happened to them that was bad. It's alongside that is a capacity to heal. And in fact, along the way, in the research, I found out about this concept of post-traumatic growth, which isn't to diminish for a second the real lived consequences of trauma and suffering. Mm -hmm. But they're not the whole story. Mm -hmm. That's, again, the complexity. Mm -hmm. Well, and that moves into the next one of active optimism and problem solving. How do you know that was a practice of the therapist for their own well being, right? So, Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And I think that kind of speaks for itself that, that, um, optimism is something to be engaged in a way. Ah, uh, but do you have anything you want to say about active optimism and active problem solving, which of course helps us feel agentic as well? Well, I know I'll give an example too. After my husband died, it was tough because it was a, I had to go back to hospice and it was really difficult to be processing that death and then going back full time in hospice. Mm-hmm. And one of the women, when everyone was telling her you're getting too weighted down in the study, she took up improv classes <laughs> and I took up gliding. I, I became a glider pilot. So I went from a lot of women actually, and the intensity of the work to an hour and a half drive out, you know, what BC is like the mountains in nature. I haven't flown for the last couple of years, but I would go drive and be out in nature. And then it would be a sea of men who were focused on adventure. And when I'd get up in the sky above Mm -hmm. everything and see the different vista in the plane, because a glider has got no engine, it's cradled in nature, Mm -hmm. there would be a lifting of what I was carrying Mm -hmm. in the work and a broadening of perspective and even being around in a sea of men versus my work, which was a lot, mostly women, just those different kind of energies, it would refresh my point of view and help my heart go back into the work during the week in a different way. So there we have some of the holographic as well, because the expanding perspective <laughs> uh, and the the countering isolation on different levels all come into what you just spoke to as well. So was active optimism and problem solving the theme where 
people sought out uh, bringing beauty in and being in like a book club with non non you know non therapists or non people who didn't work with trauma or the women who took uh, who took improv classes okay that's where that fit in well and broadening connection again too it goes back Mm -hmm. to countering isolation i also think Mm -hmm. in the work too if you think you're the only one that can fix the problem and you've forgotten there's a team or like you say collaborative people around you the weight is going to be and your perspective might not be as broad as it could be unless you get perspective from other team members right so yes other team members and as I recall, the notion of realizing, and this may became under the expanded perspective theme, the notion of realizing that we we are part, we are also linked across time with other people who have been doing this work and other people in the future who will do this work, so that we are a team with the people we know and the people we don't know in the present, but also in the past and in the future um that yeah you know I, I don't recall if that's part of the expanded perspective theme or the um but i do remember the notion of incremental change is that going to come up in one of these mm-hmm. one of these themes? well let's just speak to it now if that's coming up for you we don't have to stay on a prescriptive thing here so. well it's um the notion that change happens in step by step that it's incremental i mean sometimes change is sudden and quantum for example the difference between life and death or we see it in therapy all the time someone's what it came up like someone's having being with something painful and then they're accompanied and all of a sudden they feel better because they they had the experience of emotion and connection which is healing and then there's what comes on the other side of that which is feels good but but i'm not talking about when change is sort of non-continuous and quantum i'm talking about incremental change and this whole notion again that we cannot feel like we are going to take on all of the world's suffering or make every death beautiful i i don't think that if we we can do that uh and and feel well i think we need to realize that we are not the own i'll speak more about trauma we are not the only people who are working in the service of healing Mm -hmm. and healing on like broad social levels so that the notion that change might be happening even when we're not seeing it mm-hmm. along the way in the therapy or in the in the uh, death and dying process as you mentioned with your husband it might be happening along the way even if we're not seeing it in the moment it might but it might be there or at a larger level not just in an individual's treat the treatment of an individual but in hopefully wanting to add to the greater good sometimes it's hard to see along the way but it might be happening nonetheless Mm -hmm. in small bits (laughs) Mm -hmm. well and sometimes the small bits are even more powerful than i mean the the pivotal epiphanal kind of moments are profound but those little bits we forget about how profound they are so i really appreciate how you're honoring Mm because little bits add up (laughs) <laughs> yeah and they're they are and yes they're in, and they actually build on they expand on themselves right yeah Mot- i like, moments I like little bits <laughs> mm-hmm. in in aedp we are looking for the markers big and small of positive change mm-hmm. we don't ignore suffering and hardship for a second mm-hmm. but we also want to be attuned to the moments of positive change that maybe come alongside or in the wake of working with suffering so that because as you say they well maybe i just said they build on themselves mm-hmm. they expand yeah beautiful 
Okay, I'm looking at the time, so I'm going to kind of bring okay. some of the, the few together. Yeah. Um, holistic self-care, a lot of them did amazing self-care, and maintaining clear boundaries was really a, important as a part of that too. So can you kind of speak to those two principles together? Yeah, very briefly, holistic self-care being that we are going to take care of mind, body, spirit, relationships, on, on multiple levels. The clear boundaries is crucial because we need to be able to get close without some fusion happening or some over-identifying with someone else's experience. Because I want to be able to be there and engaged and not, but I'm not the person dying. I mean, I can't, if I take it to death and dying, if I were a person who worked in end of life care, we clearly need to be able to say, I'm here. And this is happening to that person. And I'm part of it and in it with them. Again, I feel out of my league when I'm speaking to death and dying experiences, but clear boundaries are crucial. And they they segue into empathic, um, exquisite empathy, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, the notion that I'm responsible as a therapist for the conditions, helping co-create conditions that are conducive to healing, but I'm not responsible for the change. Mm. Those boundaries are important. And in, I remember the fellow who I called Ernest, he talked about how it's not my story. It doesn't get painted on my wall. Mm. And he said he wants to be like, a screen door where the strongest wind can blow through it, come at it. But so long as the door has clear, a good framework, and then can be porous and let it come and pass through, that was one of his metaphors. Mm -hmm. um, those are crucial, I think. Otherwise, we, if we get very close to too much suffering and we don't have that clarity of what's mine and what isn't, and it's fine to be moved and to be affected, but I can't identify. Like if I really, there are people who, when they get close to someone's feelings, it's like they feel it themselves as though it's happening to the self. And that's different than empathic resonance mm. or, or, or affective emotional resonance. That's actually over-identification. And I think it's depleting and very hard to sustain oneself. Had I continued in this field as a, as a researcher, I would have looked at empathy and who, what versions of empathy are common to people who thrive and do well in this work and what, how, what quote unquote empathy is for the people who are really burning out and suffering compassion fatigue, because I have a hunch that it has to do with these boundaries. Well, you, they, like a lot of them in the boundary area, they were, they were saying they avoided dual relationships. They weren't there to save the person or take over their lives. And there was a clear um, distinction between the work and their personal life. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I find that helpful to come home from work and change clothes, for example, or to have rituals that mark that. Some people use their commute that way. I remember the woman saying, uh, I do my utmost best within the time, the hour a week I see this person. And she was saying, I'm a mother with my friends, I cook for them, but with my clients, this is where I offer what I have to offer. And that frame is part of what helped her have all the energy and joy and beauty she had to bring to the work. Well, and a lot of them in the self-care area seem to have a strong connection with nature as well, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely, absolutely. And so exquisite empathy then to, 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 to find it more deeply, you're not entangled, you're not armored up and pushing away. It's one of the women talked about it being as an art and craft. So do you want to expand on exquisite empathy? Yeah. Your it's, definition of that? It's yeah, do you have it right actually. in front of you? Do you have it right in front of you? I don't if have you don't, the that's full okay. 
definition. Okay. Well, I, you I, talked I mean, about highly present, sensitively attuned, well boundaried, heartfelt, empathetic engagement. That's it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sensitively, highly attuned, emotionally engaged, heartfelt, well boundaried. Mm-hmm. And letting ourselves be moved. That ended up being nourishing of both parties in the work. The therapist benefited from that version of getting close. Uh, That was sustaining, not depleting. Now, this may not be true for everyone. It's true for me, and it's true for those people that I interviewed, and it's true for many of my colleagues. Um... So I do want to say that this was a very surprising novel finding that went counter to the prior research and literature, because the prior research and literature talked about how burnout or, well, not burnout, but compassion fatigue, vicarious traumatization was inevitable. Now, being affected by this work is inevitable, but I hope we have time for me to talk for a moment about what we know about trauma. When people try and ward off trauma, it intrudes, it knocks on the door. But when people can integrate into their story of self, their autobiographical narrative, their their concept of their life, these things happened to me. They affected me, and this is where I am now. And you know, I that is healing. And there's tremendous body of research that shows that the intergenerational transmission of trauma in families is interrupted when a person, often a woman, is able to do exactly that, to make sense of what happened and to integrate it into sense of oneself. And then the attachment from often mother to child, the the insecurity doesn't get passed along intergenerationally when people can make sense and integrate and incorporate the hardship. So if we bring this back to the work with people who are suffering, if I try and hold it at bay, hold it at bay, that's like holding trauma at bay, and it's going to intrude. But if I let myself get very close and acknowledge with that mindful self-awareness that I am affected and that I do care, but I'm well boundaried and I know what's happening to me and what's happening to someone else, that's someone I'm caring about and close to. If I'm well boundaried, then that closeness is nourishing and sustaining and heart expanding. And both parties, it's mutually healing. And there are many days when I finish my work in my office with feeling very alive and full in my heart and in my life because I let myself work in this way. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to say it's true for everyone. Mm -hmm. Some people might be depleted by it. I don't know. But I know that for many, it's, I I want to do, say, more than uplifting and buoying. It, yeah, it's just, it's expanding and sustaining and enriching. Mm-hmm. So that's what I, I have to say about exquisite empathy. It was a surprising mm-hmm. novel finding. That's and so I, beautiful. I mean, when I first heard the word was in my conversation with beautiful. We know he's such a gracious man, Dr. Michael Carney, who's a palliative care pioneer. And he spoke mm-hmm. of your work and exquisite empathy and the next one is imagery, metaphor, and ritual. And he talked about doing a vision. He was trying to find that balance of an exquisite empathy and went on a vision quest. Mm-hmm. And just like the screen door image, yeah. he came across a nest in the stream that had fallen into a stream. And there was the boundary of the nest, but the water was still flowing through. Yeah. So, and, it's, and, and that helped him to find that artful. Mm-hmm place it's a lovely story so yeah i'm so happy to i know michael and i knew him in that era when he talked about 2008 is when i knew him and that's when in that book he talks about having become 
depleted, actually. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy for that. And so fortuitous that I met him, and it was going to a mindfulness workshop that I met Rodley Weininger, who was leading it. Beautiful, beautiful partnerships, those two. We got into conversation. All of a sudden, she said, oh, you should meet Michael and hear about what he's doing. And then when I met Michael, you know, I said, actually, maybe there's something that we could do in collaboration here rather than my just having this conversation with you and it expanded. But anyway, right. yes. It's beautiful. Yes. Well, and they're a lovely partnership, too, and mm. the, the way they serve life. So, okay. And so the last two, before I ask my final two questions. Okay. Professional satisfaction and creating meaning. I was just watching a Viktor Frankl clip the mm. other night, but so a lot of them talk about the professional satisfaction and creating meaning in the work. Do you want to? Those speak? are two separate themes, though, right? Two separate yeah. te- themes: professional mm. satisfaction yeah. and creating meaning. Yeah, my research supervisor, Dr. Marv Westwood, who's co-author with me on the um, on the published article from the dissertation research, actually recognize that theme of the professional satisfaction. And of course, again, it's in the realm of, uh, it's not depleting, it's energizing to feel like I'm satisfied in my work. It's the opposite of burnout, actually. Uh, Burnout is the, I mean, one of the components of burnout is feeling like I can't, the demand of what's expected of me exceeds capacity and there's just no way to, or little way to experience professional satisfaction. And, and again, I think a sense of um, agency and having something to offer is all built into that sense of professional satisfaction. Creating meaning. I think it's what humans do, among other things. I mean, we create meaning frames. <laughs> uh, but... I don't have a lot to say about that theme right in this moment. I don't know if you recall anything from the dissertation that resonated with you. Well, I was just thinking, because I saw a clip from Viktor Frankl, and he was in the concentration camps, and of Mm -hmm. course, wrote Mm -hmm. Man's Search for Meaning. And Mm -hmm. the emphasis in that and the article on healing connections is is that meaning is going to be unique to each person, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. only that person can find Meaning and meaning is the opposite of chaos. And some, I mean, it's not the opposite of chaos, but if I think of the river metaphor for emotional complexity and not being trapped on the rigidity or the chaos, riverbanks, creating meaning, it helps us keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. The meaning frame is important for what we're experiencing. And yet, it, I, if it's limiting, that's when it ends up being the rigidity r- riverbank. If it's uh, too limiting, mm-hmm. because then we're parking everything into what we already know, and we lose out on being open to the things that transcend our ability to know and being open to the unknown. Right. Beautiful. Well, and on the professional satisfaction one, they touched in on the concept of the wounded healer, that even though we're there to heal, we have our own wounds. And I thought it was beautiful because they were open. Many of them said they were surprised at how they were healed, Hmm. which is the concept of the wounded healer, right? Do you want to speak to that as well? Well, the concept of the wounded healer also comprises some of what you spoke about in terms of your husband's uh, final stages of life and how we can break open. And the I saw very briefly once a Jungian therapist who, who said to me, your mother's death told an tore a hole in your psyche that opened you up to a larger hole, W-H-O-L-E. And this is someone who didn't know me that well, and we didn't work together for that long, not because that she wasn't a good fit, but because I actually saw her as I was segueing out of a psychotherapy. And that's a whole other story. And part of how I segued out was to go see someone else briefly. Um, But that so resonated with me 
And many of us are, well, again, it's like post-traumatic growth. There are, I speak about the, and write sometimes about the gift side of loss. There are gift sides to loss. And the wounded healers, it, it's not just that I'm healing myself along the way, that I think that also happens through this work. But it's the notion that wounding can open us up in ways that maybe lend themselves to this kind of healing work. And when I look at my colleagues in Vancouver who have trained in similar ways that I've trained, but specifically in AADP, and I look at people's faces over time and how open mm -hmm. and less kind of protected and defended or people, it seems to be this is this, this kind of heartfelt work with exquisite empathy is healing. They are mutual, mutually healing connections. Absolutely. And so the, the wounded healers also get healed along the way or on a journey of healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think they're both components to the wounded healer. Mm -hmm. Lovely. I was actually going to ask you if you wanted to say any final words on exquisite empathy and your work, but I think you've summarized it mm -hmm. beautifully there, unless there is anything final thing mm -hmm. you want to say. No, I think you, I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay, my last signature question. Mm, okay. How has your heart been changed or has it been changed by the work that you do? Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, this work is heart expansive. <laughs> um, I, I have... So it's such an honor to have people who are wounded, who are traumatized, who are fearful of connection, find a way to let me accompany them and to see them heal and flourish, which does happen. That is heart expanding. Mm -hmm. And I think I've learned to be myself more fully in the work and in connection. I, 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 there's the professional role and there's the person in the role. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'm less of an anxious man than I used to be. Mm -hmm. And people have told me so in my personal life. So it has, I mean, it has, this work has changed me. And I don't know if my heart's bigger, but it's more open, I hope, I believe. And yeah. the pain is nearby, I'm sorry, the pain is nearby too, and they can have, I can have both. Mm. I can have both. Mm. Mm. It's beautiful, Richard. Thank you so much for mm -hmm. this conversation today. I know it's mm -hmm. going to help a lot of people. And I would, I'm, so what I'm also going to do is put a link to the dissertation and other papers you've written on this for those okay. that feel inspired to want to go deeper in understanding some of the practices and maybe how they can incorporate it into their work and life. Mm -hmm. And also another beautiful article that was co authored with a hand full of people, including Dr. Balford Mon and Dr. Michael Kearney on self-care of physicians caring for patients at end of life. I'll put a link to that. Okay, fantastic. Barbara, before we say goodbye, can I say something that I kind of wanted to say near the beginning and didn't? And that's that I wanted my research to be generative. I wanted it to have, you have to choose like criteria for validity when you're doing something like that. And I made one up, my own language for it, <laughs> pragmatic resonance. I wanted it to matter mm. to the people who do this work because I went into the PhD, I think for fairly out of, largely out of an appetite for learning and fairly 
pure motives in a way, but it has benefited me <laughs> in ways that I didn't anticipate, actually. And I did not want to be the sole person who, like, it's obscene if you go do all of this and then you write your dissertation and it just gets you your degree and then it's good, well, good for you. I wanted the work to have resonance and to be able to be meaningful to people. So you reaching out to me 14 and a half years, 15 years later, and the way that the work and the exquisite empathy has found its way into the world is so satisfying to me. I, I, I just want to thank you because just in reading it, for me, it, it was inspiring and affirming and a gift. And so it's another reason I'm so grateful you came on because especially in the times we're in right now, I do think it will benefit and serve a lot of people who love the work and might be struggling and need a new perspective on how they could maybe embrace it or grow in the work to a healthier place of service and care for themselves, right? So well, thank, thank you, you Richard. For, you're welcome. Thank you for inviting me and having me. Thank you. Okay, bye, Barbara. Bye. Farewell, and let me say, oh, sorry. Farewell, sorry. yes. And and just on a final note to bridge to um, the audience uh, in, a, in a different way, if you want to continue receiving conversations like this, please subscribe to the channel. And it also opens you up to a library of very rare conversations with noted people in end-of-life care that I know will help serve you in your work and in your life as well. And for those who are interested in my upcoming workshops, you can go to In Autumn's Cocoon dot com to learn more so thank you for joining us today um, and it's been a privilege to be with you richard take care <laughs>